Well, good morning, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. And after Chris's introduction, you know a little bit about me. I am pastoring a church right now in Santa Barbara. And before that, for seven and a half years, my family, we were serving the Lord out on the European mission field. I was the director of a small international Bible college in Germany, and it was a fantastic experience. I'm going to talk a little bit more this afternoon about our own experiences on the European field and all of that. That's enough about me. I I think about you. I mean, I know right now I'm speaking to the majority of your Biola students, almost everybody in this room. And I also know this. I also know that you kind of have to be here. I know that you're not all fired up about missions. But listen, this is what I want to say is what I have to share with you this morning It isn't necessarily about just having a life that's interested in cross-cultural missions, but more living a life that recognizes the generational pass of the faith from one generation to another. Because even though I know know, most all of you are Biola students, I wouldn't even presume that you're all in the faith. Look, I know that some people walk away from their faith when they go to university, even a good Christian liberal arts university. I know that some of you, you're struggling, you're battling, you're not even part of this whole thing of this Christian world, but you're here, you're here to listen, and I pray that God will speak to you right now. And listen, in this this great theme of a conference that you have for Consume, it's all about a fire, a fire from God coming and making a difference in the life of an individual. You can talk about it, as you heard from yesterday, about it being true in the life of Isaiah, right? Right? That burning coal from the altar coming and touching his lips. You could talk about it from the context of the Hebrews text that's connected with this conference. The fact that our God is a consuming fire. But this morning, I want to talk to you about it in the life of a prophet of fire from the pages of the Old Testament. And that would be Elijah the prophet. So if you have a Bible, 2 Kings chapter 2. Turn on your Bible, use your smartphone, open up the pages, whatever you got. 2 Kings chapter 2. Now, if there was ever a prophet of fire, it was Elijah. He appeared suddenly in Israel during the days of the reign of apostate, the reign of Ahab, the apostate. Now, Ahab was a great ruler in some ways. He led the northern kingdom of Israel into a season of uh, military success and economic prosperity. But spiritually, the reign of Ahab was a disaster. He and his wife Jezebel, they brought in state-sponsored idolatry. And listen, it's one thing when there's idolatry in a land. It's a whole other thing when the state decides that it's going to fund it and put the false prophets on the payrolls. In the midst of that kind of time, God raised up this man named Elijah. Now, Elijah, his even name testified to his mission. Elijah means Yahweh is my God. And in those days of great apostasy, even his name was a testimony to the truth. In those days, there were only 7,000 believers in the whole land of Israel who had not worshipped Baal. But but even those 7,000 were so beaten down, they were so paralyzed with fear, that Elijah didn't even know they existed, much less that they had a strong faith. It was a crucial time in the history of Israel. It looked like the faith in the true God might be passed away from the northern kingdom altogether. The land swarmed with the priests of Baal and Asherah. That They were greedy, they were licentious, they were debased. And the fires of persecution began to rage against those who really served God. Now, in the midst of that kind of situation, God raised up another prophet of fire... This kind of fire came from the Lord God. Now, remember when Elijah challenged the prophets on Mount Carmel? By the way, just to give you a little background, I'm going to speak to you today as if you're a biblically literate group. I know that you're not necessarily all of you, but I'll speak to you that way. If I say things or make connections in the Bible that you're not really aware of, take a note and look it up later on. But there's Elijah on the prophet, the prophet on the Mount of Carmel, and he's challenging the prophets of Baal. And he challenges them to a contest of fire, right? It's Elijah, that very same prophet, who challenged them to see which God will answer by fire. Will it be Baal or will it be the Lord God? And let me tell you, he saw God answer by fire. A fire that burned up not only the the sacrifice 
not only that sacrificial bull, but also the wood, also the, the, the stones of the altar, the dust of the altar, and it even says the water that was in the trench around the altar, the fire from heaven consumed all of that. But that wasn't the end of it. He also saw fire come down from heaven and consume soldiers that were sent by a subsequent king of Israel named Ahaziah who tried to arrest Elijah, but it wouldn't happen because fire came down from heaven and consumed them. Elijah was a man so connected with this consuming fire that even his passing of this world to the next was connected with fire. And that's what we're going to look at right now. Second Kings chapter two, verse one. And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Look, I don't know how it is for you when you read the Bible. When I read the Bible, it's like a movie running in my head. Can't you see it laid out right before you here? There's the older prophet Elijah. There's the younger prophet Elisha. And what you have right here is a passing of the torch from one generation to another. You have this older prophet who recognizes that his days on earth are now measured in hours or minutes. He's leaving, but he has to pass it on to another man. And God had already appointed his successor. And this was this younger prophet, Elisha. I got to say, I don't think of myself as an old man, but I don't kid myself. I'm not young. I'm old enough to be the father of most of you. And I have my own kids who are about your age or a little bit older. And it makes me think of the generational past from one generation to another. Because look, let's face it, right? Christianity is always one generation away from perishing on the earth. If it doesn't pass from one generation to another, it doesn't pass. Now look, I'm not pessimistic about that because I believe that it will pass. I believe that it does. I look at your generation and I get excited about what God's doing in the midst of that generation. No, my, my concern for you isn't that you'll apostatize or you'll lose the faith or somehow the promise of Jesus will be proved to be untrue, that he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. I believe the promise of Jesus. I hope you do as well. But listen, this is my concern is that your generation maximizes your opportunity because in a lot of ways, your generation has opportunities that no previous generation has ever seen. Here's the question. Are you going to seize on to those opportunities when the responsibility passes from a prior generation, namely mine, to your generation, and that torch is being passed right at this time? You see, at this time, verse 1 tells us that the Lord was about to take Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind. And apparently, with somewhat common knowledge, the people standing by, the school of the prophets, whatever you want to call it, they knew that he was going to be taken up by a whirlwind into heaven. And so what Elijah, the older prophet, wanted to do was test the devotion of the younger prophet. He said, if you're with me, if you stay with me, then God will pass something special on to you. And that's what he said. Look at it in verse two. He says, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. Elijah is seeming to test the devotion of Elisha. And can I just say that's one thing that my generation wants to look at at your generation and ask questions about. Are you devoted? Are you devoted unto the Lord? Do you love Jesus? Are you fired up about his word? Now listen, there there are questions our generation has about yours, but it's not unreasonable to think that the older generation inquires into the devotion to the passion of the younger generation. Now look at what happens next, starting at verse four. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, Do you not know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So he answered, yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So as the two of them went on and 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Do you see the picture here? Is the movie running in your mind? 
Here's the older prophet, Elijah, continuing to test the devotion of the younger prophet. He says to Elisha, hey, I'm going on to Jericho. Are you going to go? Well, yes, maybe not, maybe no. Okay, no, I'm going. Do not try to dissuade me. I'm going on to the Jordan. Are you going to come? Yes, I'm going to come. Don't try to push me aside. But if you notice here, it's something wonderful at verse 7. If I could just make a little bit of a rabbit trail here. Notice at verse 7, it says that they separated themselves from the other sons of the prophets. They did this at a distance. Now you're going to see in the following verses that even that distance wasn't enough because they went over on the other side of the Jordan River. But notice this. Friends, one of the most incredible spiritual experiences that the Bible describes is about to happen in the coming verses. Something that you and I, if we saw it with our physical eyes, if we were here to watch it and make a video of it, we'd be absolutely astounded at what happened. One of the most spectacular spiritual experiences in all the Bible is about to take place, yet... The older prophet Elijah wanted it to be done out of the public view. You see, he had a contentment with what I would call secret experiences. Listen, I just think this is relevant to our own day and age. The prophet Elijah desired to be alone and to not have his tremendous spiritual experience on display for other people to see. And can I say that in some regard, this shames us. Because so much of our own walk with God, so much of our own intimate experience with God, we put it on display for everybody to see, right? It's a little bit shameless, our age. With the social media at our disposal, with the ability that we have to be interconnected and communicating with everybody seemingly at all times. Now listen, all that interconnectedness is a gift from God. It's something for us to leverage for the glory of his kingdom. But tell you, is there not a danger connected with it as well? The danger is simply this. That our Christian experience, our intimacy with God is really just done to be on display. That, that it almost doesn't have any meaning unless other people can see me doing it. It doesn't even count if I have a deep experience with God unless I can tell everybody about it. Friends, we've got to move beyond that. We've got to move beyond that to a place where we understand that the value, that the power, that the riches of it sometimes is only displayed and made real in that very secret place. Anyway, he continues on. Elisha, the younger prophet, he won't be turned aside until he asks in verse 8. Look at it here. Now, Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water. Don't you have the kind of idea of a towel snap with that kind of thing? Rolled it up, struck the water, and it was divided this way and that so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Oh, come on now. Let the movie run in your head, right? There's these two men approaching the edge of the Jordan River. It's a natural barrier. It's not something that they could normally just skip across. But what happens? The older prophet Elijah does something remarkable there. He rolls up and in, as I said before, some kind of towel snap kind of way. Verse 8 tells us that there was a strange and a unique miracle uh, on a whole day of strange and unique miracles where he walked in the steps of Moses. He walked in the steps of Joshua and saw God miraculously part waters before them. He goes up to the edge of the Jordan. He snaps it with his mantle and the waters are parted. I don't know exactly how it happened. I don't know what the natural explanation would be for that. You can research that on your own. But listen, Elijah did this to put more distance between himself and the eyes of the sons of the prophet before this marvelous spiritual experience that the following verses are going to describe. But before he does, in verse 9, he asks a very important question of Elijah. Did you see that? Look at it again, verse 9. Ask, what may I do for you before I'm taken away from you? Now that's a big invitation, isn't it? I'm leaving you. I'm going to go. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want? It almost has the uh, idea of an open invitation, right? Ask whatever you want and it'll be for you. What what do you want? Here's a big open check for you to write. And look at what his response is in verse 9. You saw it. You know this phrase, right? He asked, 
please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Now listen, wouldn't you agree right there? That Elisha asked for a big thing. A double portion of the mighty spirit of Elijah. Now, Elisha had seen how the Spirit of God worked through Elijah. He looked at that and he said, I want that and more. He could ask for anything, but he asked for this. He didn't ask for wealth. He didn't ask for status. He didn't ask for fame. He didn't ask for power. He didn't ask for any of those worldly advantages that somebody might go after in the world today. What he wanted was he wanted spiritual commission and he wanted spiritual power. He had this reliance on and hunger for the Holy Spirit. Look, as I think of the pass from one generation to another, You are never going to fulfill what God has for you as a generation unless you rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll say it again because it's so important. You're never going to fulfill what God has for your generation. Whether you live it out here in Southern California or whether you live it out in the uttermost parts of the earth, you're never going to fulfill what God has for your life without a reliance upon the power of the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what Elisha was asking for. But he asked for a double portion. Now, friends, I don't think he was asking for twice as much as the Spirit of God. I really don't think that's the idea. It it, it seems biblically the idea of a double portion was the idea of inheritance. Let me explain to you what I mean. If a farmer in Israel had four sons, they would divide the inheritance five ways. And the eldest son would get two portions. He got the double portion because he was the main inheritor. I want to be your main heir. I really believe that that's what Elisha was asking of Elijah. I want to be your main heir. I want to inherit and follow in the footsteps of your ministry. And what did he reply? You saw it there in verse 10. Did you see the promise that Elijah made to Elisha? He said, If you see me when I'm taken away from you, it shall be done for you. And now notice this. Before he was testing his devotion, now it's coming into fruition. He says, if you stick with me devoted until the end, you're going to get the request that you've asked for. And that promise would be fulfilled. Are I ready for this? Starting now at verse 11. Then it happened. Let the movie run in your head. Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, and he went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. You see that in verse 11 first? It says, as they continued on and talked. Man, if there's ever a recording of a conversation that I wish I had, that's one of them from the Bible, right? What do they talk about? What does the younger prophet talk about with the older prophet? What does the older prophet want to bestow upon the younger prophet? What what did they ask? Does Elisha, the, the younger prophet, does he ask him, how do you plow such hard ground? How do you trust God with the impossible? How do you train somebody like you trained me? What's it like knowing that very soon you're going to pass from this world? I don't know what the questions were. I don't know what the conversation was. But listen, that would have been something that even the angels would have been stooping down to hear the conversation between these two men of God. But what happens in the midst of their conversation? There they are speaking together, talking on, passing on, relating one to another. Do you see what happens in verse 11? Suddenly... A chariot of fire speared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. All right, now look, this is a strange and unique miracle. Can we not agree? But please notice what happened when did not happen. Elijah did not ride in a chariot of fire up to heaven. Look at the text carefully. It explains it to you. It's not hard to understand if you just look at it carefully. How did Elijah get carried up into heaven? By a whirlwind, right? What was the purpose of the chariot of fire and the horses of fire? 
to separate the two of them. That's how close Elisha wanted to be to Elijah, that God had to send a chariot of fire and a horse of fire to part the two of them so that he could take Elijah up to heaven. Now listen, that's following close, right? When God has to send a chariot of fire and a horse of fire to part two people, they're following pretty closely one with another. And Elijah was carried up into heaven, not on a chariot of fire, but certainly in the context of fire. Not a strange fire like Nadab and Abihu in the days of Moses, but God's consuming fire. If you think about that fire, the fire speaks of boldness. The fire speaks of power. The, the, The fire speaks of unstoppable, helpful. It brings light. It brings heat. That's what God carried the older prophet Elijah, up into heaven. So do you have that picture there? Elijah's carried up into heaven. He's gone. He's taken up in the whirlwind. The chariot of fire, the horse of fire separated the two of them. And as he's reeling back from the heat of those chariots of fire and the, the, the horse of fire, what does he do? He cries out right there in verse 12, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. It's actually a profound statement. Look, back then, a nation would measure its military might. It would measure its security in terms of how many chariots you have, how many horsemen you have. Do you see what Elisha was saying right there? He looked at the older prophet being carried away on a whirlwind up to heaven, and he said, that's the strength of Israel. That's worth any number of nuclear weapons. That's worth more than any army division or, or Marine Corps group. That's the true strength. That's the true power of Israel. And it says there in verse 12 that Elisha saw it. And look, there's a sense in which everything we've looked at before all leads up to verse 13. Put your focus right there with it, if you would. Verse 13 is a beautiful thing because as Elijah is carried up into heaven on the whirlwind, what falls down to earth? A mantle. You know what a mantle is? No, not the thing that goes over the fireplace, right? That's not a, ma- that's a mantle, but it's not what we're talking about. A, a mantle is like a, 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 a small blanket that you put over your shoulders, right? We might even call it a shawl, but you wouldn't associate something girly like a shawl with a great prophet like this, but something along those lines, right? Here comes down this mantle falling from heaven, the same mantle that Elijah the prophet wore. It floats down from heaven. It lands on the ground. And what does it say? Verse 13, that symbol of the prophet, the symbol of his authority, his prophetic strength, his commission from God. Verse 13 tells us that he took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him. Now, since the mantle was the special mark of a prophet, this was an extremely meaningful occasion, right? He took it up, he put it around his shoulders, and what was he saying when he did that? He said, I want to pick up the torch and carry it on to a new generation. Now, that's the challenge that goes out to you and to your generation, right? There's a mantle that's falling down from heaven, from your forebears, from the people who've gone before you in a previous generation. And you know what? I look at my generation and how we've served God. Listen, I'm speaking as if I have one foot in the grave, and I'm not there yet, but it feels like it sometimes. But really, it's not too early to begin thinking about how you guys are going to serve God in your generation. I look at my generation, and honestly, if I could give this assessment, I think we've done pretty well serving God. Oh, not perfectly. I can talk to you about a dozen or two dozen or three dozen different faults or errors or weaknesses. But nevertheless, I don't have any doubt that we have done something in our generation for the glory of God. But you've got to do more. The mantle gets passed down to you and you have a choice right there. The same choice that Elisha had when it came down from heaven. Are you going to pick it up and are you going to put it on? He had to decide to do that. Look, let me tell you this. The mantle did not fall miraculously from heaven and rest upon his shoulders like a dove coming down upon him, right? It fell to the ground. And he had to decide, am I going to pick it up and put it on my shoulders? Am I willing to take this responsibility to fulfill this calling, to answer what God has challenged me to do in my generation, just like my predecessor did it in his generation? Took it, 
He put it on, and he did something really, really wonderful. Look at it here at verse 14. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, and he struck the water. And he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also struck the water, it was divided this way and that. And Elisha crossed over. Now, when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and they bowed to the ground before him. Please, I beg of you, let the movie run in your mind. The two prophets crossed over the Jordan in a miraculous way, right? Elijah, the older prophet, takes the mantle off of his shoulder, rolls it up like a towel, snaps it somehow on the water, and there's a miraculous division, a miraculous parting of the waters, and the two of them walk across the Jordan as if it was on dry ground. They do their business on the other side of the Jordan. Elijah is carried up to heaven in a whirlwind, separated from the younger prophet by a chariot of fire and horses of fire. The mantle falls down. He gets it. He puts it on his shoulders, but as he comes back to the Jordan River, he understands that it's time for him to figure it out. Where is the God of Elijah? I want you to notice, he didn't ask where Elijah was, right? He knew where Elijah was. He knew Elijah had been carried up by a whirlwind into heaven. That wasn't his question. What was his question? Where is the Lord God of Elijah? You see, Elisha knew this. That the power of God didn't rest in fiery chariots and in fiery horses. He knew this, that, that, the, that the power of God didn't rest in magic mantles that floated down from heaven, right? He knew that the power of God rested in the person of the Lord God himself. And so when it comes for a new, fresh generation of pow- uh, g- a demonstration of power in his own generation, what does he do? He says, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Now that's a good question to ask. Because if God expected this younger prophet to continue on in the office and the calling of the older prophet, it could only happen if he was filled with the same kind of power. So it's almost as if it's almost as if Elisha is asking this. He's asking, where's the God who kept Elijah faithful when a whole nation turned from God? Where's the God who uh, mightily answered prayer from Elijah? Where's the God who provided miraculously for Elijah? Where's the God who raised the dead through Elijah? Where's the God who answers prayer by sending fire from heaven at the prayer of Elijah? Where's the God who encouraged that discouraged prophet? Where's the God who carried Elijah away into heaven? And listen, this is a question for every generation to ask. Look, I'll just be so bold to say, It is a question for you to ask. You, here, right now, in your seat. Where is the Lord God, the power of the living God in your life? Every generation must have their own experience with God. You relying on my generation's experience, it will never work. Now, especially this is so, if God did something wonderful in the previous generation. Did God do something wonderful in the days of Elijah? You better believe he did. But that made it all the more important for the younger prophet to say, I will not trust on what God did in a previous generation. I'm going to ask God to do something in my generation. Friends, it's been this way throughout all of God's great redemptive history, isn't it? Didn't Isaac have to ask, where's the God of Abraham? Didn't Joshua have to ask, where's the God of Moses? Didn't Solomon have to ask, where's the God of David? Didn't Peter have to ask, where's the God of Jesus of Nazareth? Didn't Timothy have to ask, where's the God of the Apostle Paul? Athanasius had to ask, where's the God of Alexander? Melanchthon had to ask, where's the God of Martin Luther? And you've got to ask the question in a way that makes sense for you. And I don't know who your heroes are of the faith in this modern generation. I don't know if some of you would say, where's the God of Billy Graham? Where's the God of Tim Keller? Where's the God of John Piper? I don't know what you'd say. You fill in the blank for yourself. But that God that moved in a mighty way through them, he's got to be real in your life or the torch doesn't get passed on from one generation to another. 
So here he comes. He stands before the water. The mantle's off. It's in his hands. He rolls it up like he's going to snap a towel or something. He says, where is the God of Elijah? And then what did he do? Verse 14, some most beautiful faith-filled words in this text. It says that he also struck the water. It was divided. Now, I don't know what his attitude of faith was. Faith is a curious thing, isn't it? Sometimes faith says, I know it's going to happen. Sometimes faith says, oh, I really hope you're going to do it, Lord. Sometimes faith says, all right, Lord, I'll do it. Let's see what happens. I don't know. But he did it. And what happened? He had the same power in ministry that Elijah had before him. He came back over a divided Jordan River the same way that the two prophets had gone before in just a few moments. This is what I love. He put God to the test and he did it immediately. All right, God, you want it to pass from my gener- from that generation unto my generation? Let's see if you're for real, God. I'll put you to the test. Are you the God that has the same kind of power? He did it and God blessed it. He got about the business. I love what Charles Spurgeon says on this point. Let me read you a little paragraph from him. He says, and when you have got their mantle, do not waste precious time in lamentations about them anymore. Get to your business. There is a river in your way. What then? Well, go to the Jordan as the prophet Elisha did and try to pass it. Say not, where is Elijah? But where is the Lord God of Elijah? Elijah is gone, but God is not. Elijah has gone away, but Jehovah is present still. And it's true. And the sooner you find out it's true, the better. And if I could say, and I hope this doesn't sow a, a seed of unbelief in anybody's heart, if it's not true, the sooner you find it out, the better. Either the Lord God reigns and he's real and his power is going to be real, not according to every expectation. I'm not saying that you can never be wrong in what you think is a step of faith and have God later instruct you that it was an unwise. But listen, God is real and the sooner you find out that it's true, it's better. And if he's not real, the sooner you find out it's false, the better. Listen, I stand before you and hundreds of people here this morning would testify to you. Oh, he's real. We've seen it in our life. We've seen it in our generation. Now you experience it for your generation. So much so that look at what it says in verse 15. It says that the spirit of Elijah rests on Elijah. This was the succession from one generation to another, and it was apparent to other people. He didn't have to persuade them. He didn't didn't have to, no, no, really, really, I have the power of Elijah. No, he just did it, and people noticed it because God demonstrated the power of that work. God's work goes on. You know it, don't you? That God is greater than any particular man or woman that he might use. Some people worry about God's work going on in the next generation. They shouldn't worry. God's work goes on. They should pray, but they shouldn't worry. Because Jesus Christ is going to continue his work from generation to generation. Listen, in all of this, we see an answer to the great question Where was the Lord God of Elijah? I want to tell you, there's two places where I see God demonstrated in this, where I see the answer to the question, where is the Lord God of Elijah? The two places are, first of all, notice, Elisha, the younger prophet, could find the God of Elijah in the prophet's words, the word of God. And that was shown by taking the prophet's mantle. Listen, a prophet was about a lot of things. He was about righteousness. He was about justice. He he was about reform. He was about standing up for what was right and what was good. But it all flowed out of the prophet's relationship with the word of God, right? Wasn't a prophet that more than anything else? The prophet was a messenger of the word of God. When he took up that mantle and placed it upon his shoulders, it was a declaration. It was a powerful way to simply say this. I trust in the word of God delivered to that senior prophet. He's my spiritual prophet. So don't forget what these men were. They they were prophets of the living God. Yes, they did miracles, but they were more than traveling itinerant miracle workers. They were men who delivered a message from God. God's word was central to who they are and what they did. They they weren't prophets who, who were sort of called themselves prophets. They were prophets because 
They were men who boldly spoke to their generation. And you couldn't do that without having this intimate connection with God's word. So look, that's my first challenge to you. I have the opportunity to say it to your generation whenever I have the chance. Listen, if there's one thing that I question, and I'm not going to say I'm worried about it, but I'll just say I question it when I look at your generation. I see your generation, and I see a generation that loves Jesus. I see a generation that knows the culture. I see a generation that knows the technology. you got the technology wired. And I think all of those things are good. Your love for Jesus, your connection with the culture, your, your, your grasp of technology, all of those things are good and God will use them. But sometimes I wonder, do they really love the word of God the way they should? Do they think of it as passe? They think of something archaic for, for the old folks to be consumed with. Friends, if you're going to pass it on from one generation to another, just as much as the younger prophet gained it from the older prophet, it is about having a love and an honor and a passion for the word of God. Let it sink down deep. God will meet you in his word. He'll reveal himself and his faithfulness and his glory to you in the midst of his word. I'm not saying that's the only way he does it, but it's a powerful and a significant way. But secondly, not only could Elisha find the God of Elijah in the word of the prophet, but also in the faith-filled works of the older prophet. You see what he's saying right there? When he snapped the mantle on the Jordan and said, where is the God of Elijah? He was trying to follow in the faith-filled works of his predecessor. Now, what faith-filled works has God called you to do? Now, I know this is a mission conference, and there's some of you who think that God could be calling you to something cross-cultural. Listen, that's glorious. It doesn't matter if God keeps you local or sends you distant. God has faith-filled works for you to continue. Don't you believe that? I certainly do. It isn't enough to know God through the same word as the generations before. You have to know him through the same works of faith. You've got to determine in your mind that you're not going to play it safe. That you're going to do something bold enough for God that if God doesn't do it, it'll be a great big flop. Great big failure. Are you willing to do such a thing? Now listen, I find sometimes in your generation an inordinate fear of failure in the work of God. I don't know if you've seen a lot of success around you and you think it's, it's your job to live up to all the success around you. That, that if you have anything less than a mega work for God, then somehow you failed. Wipe that, that unbelievably fleshly and worldly thinking out of your mind. Stop being so afraid of failure. Now look, uh, to be honest, it, it's not failure that we're afraid of, right? It's being known as a failure. If you could fail secretly and nobody knows it, what would you say? Oh, who cares? No big deal. But what you're afraid of is to fail in a public way. Can I say, cast that upon the Lord. For some of you, that'll be the most significant and in retrospect, most glorious work God does in your life, what he do, does in and through your failures. So don't worry about it. Step out in faith. Let God do that great work. It's easy because God really is the same God. It's easy because God wants you to do this, but it's hard. Because listen, the generation before you has had a lifetime or at least decades of living out those works of faith. You're just beginning. And it's hard because you can't artificially manufacture these works of faith, right? They have to happen in the course of going for it and serving God in daily life. Friends, that was our experience stepping out from a more comfortable Southern California lifestyle and going to Europe for missionary service. All I can say is God met us in that work of faith. I'll talk a little bit more about it in our second session here this afternoon. Listen, God has demonstrated himself faithful in our lives. He will in yours. Elisha could never find the God of Elijah apart from living a life of faith. It just won't happen. And so listen, it was of no use saying, where is the God of Elijah? Maybe he's abandoned me. 
No, you step forward in faith, trusting that God will do what he said he would do. Because listen, here's the truth. The God of Elijah, the God of Moses, the God of David, the God of Paul, the God of Martin Luther, the God of Billy Graham, the God of John Piper, that God can be found and experienced by your generation, but only through the word of God and living a life of faith. That part of it was up to Elisha to carry on. Now, it's up to you. Now, I wish I could play Holy Spirit in your life and direct you. Well, actually, I don't wish that. It's just not of great interest to me. How about this? Let's let the Holy Spirit play the Holy Spirit in your life, right? And let's allow the Holy Spirit to tell you how that life of faith translates into what he's called you to, but you better believe that it does. The torch passes from my generation to your generation. I'm absolutely filled with utter optimism that your generation will not only fulfill your role, but in a more glorious way than mine. But it won't happen. It won't happen apart from trusting in the word of God and faith-filled actions stepping out to believe God. And let me conclude with this. I think any time we look at a text, Old Testament, New Testament, we should always, even if it's at a backward glance, we should ask ourselves, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus in our text? Don't you see a beautiful, beautiful display of Jesus right here in our text? Oh, come on, you saw it, right? Didn't you see Jesus right in the midst of our text? All right, let me help you out. Who ascended to heaven in a cloud, blessing his people as he left in the company of his disciples and sent down gifts from heaven that they had to receive and take unto themselves? Who did that? It was Jesus himself. Don't you see that in a lot of ways, Elijah's ascension up into heaven in the whirlwind is in many ways just a prefiguring of our great Savior's work for us. Because after he did all that he did for us on the cross, after he paid all the the, the payment that uh, our sin required, all the guilt, all the shame, all the, the, the judgment our sin deserved, he bore it upon himself after his glorious resurrection, after he demonstrated himself to be alive for 40 days after his resurrection, after all that, he ascended up into heaven in the presence of his disciples. And was that not a generational pass? Did he not pass it from his work onto their work and send down the spirit of God and gifts of the spirit from heaven to be bestowed upon his disciples that they could continue on in the same faith-filled works? Here's the bottom line. We inherit not the mantle of Elijah. No, no, (laughs) your level is set way too low if you're hoping to inherit the mantle of Elijah. You inherit the mantle of Jesus. He called you and he sort of said, as the father sent forth me, so I send forth you into this world. That's the mantle you inherit. He sends it down from heaven. He sends you forth with his mantle, with his mandate. And he says, will you take it? Will you follow along? I believe you will. I'm filled with a lot of hope, with a lot of anticipation, with a lot of excitement about your generation. Pick it up and run with it. 